guys and welcome you to the very first reading in our fall 2011 uh, Writer Speak series. Um, we have a kind of amazing roster of readers this semester and I hope you'll come back next week when the poet Robert Polito will be reading. Um, if you forget that, you can actually find us on Facebook as of yesterday or the day before under Writers Speak Wednesdays. Please like us. <laughs> and um, and um, also, in a related thing, and even fresher news, uh, if you're interested in submitting to the Southampton Review, our reading period is just open and will be open until November 1st. And you can also find that out again on Facebook under the Southampton Review as of an hour ago. Thank you, Faith, <laughs> wherever you are. Um, we have a tradition here um, at the MFA program that we do no introductions for our, for our guests because we feel that their work speaks for itself. Um, I, I can't think of a, an author about whom that is more true than the person that I'm about to introduce. And I'm so thrilled uh, to welcome Jay McInerney to our stage. Hi, and thanks for coming out in the rain. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read a story I've never read before. Um, I don't usually get 35 or 40 minutes, so, but uh, it's somewhat seasonal. Um, Thanksgiving, anyway. Um, this gives you all a reason to dread Thanksgiving. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's called The Madonna of Turkey Season. It's one of the stories from my most recent collection, uh, How It Ended, which was published in 2009. And uh, <clears throat> I hope it doesn't need any introduction, or else I left something out. It came to seem like our own special Thanksgiving tradition, one of us inevitably behaving very badly. The role was passed around the table from year to year like some kind of ceremonial torch or a seasonal virus, the weeping and gnashing of teeth, the breaking of glass, the hurling of accusations, the final nose dive into the mashed potatoes or the shag carpet. <laughs> Sometimes it even fell to our guests, friends, girlfriends, wives, the disease apparently communicable. <laughs> we were three boys who'd lost their mother, four if you counted dad, five if you counted Brian's best friend, Foster Creel, who'd lost his own mother about the same time we did and always spent Thanksgiving with us. And for many years, there had been no one to tell us not to pour that pivotal seventh drink, not to chew with our mouths open, not to say fuck at the dinner table. We kept bringing other women to the table to try to fill the hole, but there were they were never able to impose peace for long. Sometimes they were catalysts, and occasionally they even initiated the hostilities, perhaps their way of trying to fit in. Our father never brought another woman to the table, though many tried to invite themselves, and our young girlfriends remarked on how handsome he was and what a waste it was. I had my great love, and how could I settle for anything less, he'd say, as he poured himself another Smirnoff, and the neighbor's win widows, <coughs> neighbor widows and divorcees dashed themselves against the window panes <laughs> like birds. <laughs> Sometimes, though not always, the mayhem boiled up again at Christmas in the sacramental presence of yet another turkey carcass with a new brother or guest in the role of incendiary device though memories of the most recent Thanksgiving were often enough to spare us the spectacle for another 11 months. I suppose we all had a lot to be thankful for, socioeconomically speaking, but for some reason we chose to dwell on our grievances. How come you went to Finley's high school play and not mine? How could you have fucked Karen Whaley when you knew that I was in love with her? We would arrive Tuesday night from prep school or college, or on Wednesday night from New York where we were working at a bank while writing a play, or from Vermont while where we were building a log cabin with our roommate from Middlebury before heading up to snow at, Stowe at first snow for a season of ski bumming. Dad would take the latter part of the week off until he retired, which was when things really became dangerous. 
The riotous foliage that briefly inflamed the chaste New England hills was long gone, leaving the monochromatic landscape of winter. The gray stone walls of the early settlers, the silver trunks of the maples, the white columns of birch. Manly hugs were exchanged at the kitchen door. Cocktails were offered and accepted. Girlfriends and roommates introduced. The year of the big snow, footwear was scraped on the blade of the cast iron boot cleaner outside the door. Dan was particularly pleased with this instrument and always pointed it out to guests, not because he was particularly fastidious about mud and snow, but because it seemed to signify all the supposed charm and tradition of old New England, <laughs> as opposed to, say, its intolerance of immigrants and its burning of young girls at the stake. <laughs> Although he brought this particular boot scraper once upon a time at the local True Value hardware store. But somehow Daddy convinced himself that it had been planted here by the early settlers of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in between skirmishes with the Iroquois and the Mohicans. He liked to think of himself as an old Yankee, despite the fact that when his grandfathers arrived in Boston, the windows were full of no Irish need apply signs, and they weren't likely to be invited to scrape their boots at anybody's front door. A century and a half later, though, we lived in a big white house with green shutters, which Dad inevitably described as colonial, though it was built in the 1920s, to resemble something a hundred years older. Most of the girls we brought, a cavalcade of blondes, were judged by their resemblance to our mother, except when it seemed, as was the case a couple of times with Brian, they'd been deliberately chosen for their controversial darkness. Each of us could see how his brother's girlfriend was a pale imitation of mom, and our own were one-offs who shared her best qualities. The girls, for their part, must have been a little daunted at first to discover the patterns of trait, traits that they had cherished as unique. As different as we were, we were all recognizably alike, with the same unruly hair, the same heavy-browed, smiley eyes, and all our invisible resemblances born and bred. Brian, the eldest, kept things lively by bringing a different girl every year. We called him the Kennedy of the family. <laughs> the rest of us took after Dad, who liked to say that Mom was his only true love. Mike had been with Jennifer since his freshman year at Colby, and Adrian met his future wife, Alana, before he was 20. Actually, Brian showed up two years in a row with Janice, with whom he, <coughs> whom he eventually married, much to our and then his own chagrin. <laughs> The second time, she threw the entire uncarved turkey at Brian's head, <laughs> a scene that eventually showed up in his second play. Another year, he and Foster nearly came to blows <clears throat> when, it <clears throat> when it came out that they'd lately been sleeping with the same girl. It took two of us to restrain Brian. Brian's personal life, with all its chaos, was the workshop version of his professional life, a, lab a laboratory for drama. And of course, he wrote about us. Mike said at the time that thin, the phrase thinly described was too chubby by half to describe Brian's relation to his source material. <laughs> his first play revolved around the death of a mother from cancer. There seemed to be a number of those that particular season, but this was the most successful. We all went down to the opening night at the New York Theater Workshop. The play was directed by Foster, who'd been his best friend ever since Choate and had gone with him to the Yale Drama School. We sat there, stunned in the aftermath, as the applause thundered around us. It was hard to know how to react. Brian seemed to be making a special claim for himself with regard to our mother, in that the character, who was obviously him, had been more loved and more devastated than the others. And then there was the question of his portrayal of the rest of us. On the one hand, as brothers, we wanted to say, hey, that's not me, and on the other, but wait a minute, that is me. He put us in an untenable position. Brian was a great sophist, and if you complained about the parallels between his life and art, he would start declaiming about the autobiographical basis of Long Day's Journey into Night, or point out that your character had gone to Deerfield when you'd actually gone to Hotchkiss. <laughs> and if you complained about inaccuracies, denied that you'd ever, for example, had carnal relations with the family dog, he would cite <laughs> poetic license or remind you that you'd been <clears throat> banging on a moment before about resemblances and that this clearly demonstrated the fictionality of his masterpiece. At first it was hard to tell how Dad felt about it. He put on a brave face and went over to Phoebe's, the bar down the block, to celebrate with Brian and the cast. 
He seemed to be in shock. But later in the cab, back to the hotel and in the bar, he kept asking us over and over again some variant of the question, was I a bad father? In truth, he hadn't come off all that badly, but we all had a hard time not viewing the play as a flawed family memoir. Dad also cornered Foster, our unofficial fourth brother, whom for years he'd consulted as a kind of emotional translator in his efforts to understand Brian. Every artist interprets the world through the prism of his own narcissism, Foster told him that night. He doesn't think you're a bad father. He forgot about you the day he started writing the play. All the characters in the play, even the ones who look and sound like you, were Brian, or else they're foils for Brian. I don't think my father knew whether to be reassured or worried by this. Of course, he'd long known that Brian was massively self-absorbed, prone to exaggeration and outright mendacity, but he seemed pleased with this judgment, repeated to us all many times later that Brian was an artist. At, li at last, he seemed to feel there was an explanation for his temperament and his deviations from what my father considered proper behavior the drugs, the senseless prevarications, the childhood interest in poetry. For Dad, Foster's assessment counted as much as, as subsequent accolades in the New York Times and elsewhere. That year, Brian brought Cassie Haynes, the actress who played his former girlfriend, Rita Kosevich, in the play, although, of course, he denied that the character was based on Rita, and we all wondered if Rita would, on balance, be more offended by the substance of her portrait or flattered by its appearance, Cassie being a babe of the first order. She caused a bit of a sensation around the neighborhood that Thanksgiving, hu husbands coming from three streets down to ask after the leaf blower they thought they might possibly have lent Dad earlier in the fall. When we heard she was coming, we all thought, great, just what we need, a prima donna actress, so we couldn't help liking her and hoping she would come back during bathing suit season. <laughs> Ryan's play gave us something to fight about at that <coughs> Thanksgiving board for years to come, beginning that first November after the opening when the wounds were still fresh. Mike, the middle brother, was the first to take up the cause after cocktail hour had been prolonged due to some miscalculation about the turkey. Mike's fiance, Jennifer, had volunteered to cook the bird that year, and when she, <coughs> she would later become our while she would later become our chief and favorite cook, this was her first attempt at a turkey, and rather than relying on mom's old copy of the Fanny Farmer cookbook, she insisted on adapting a chicken recipe from Julia Child's Mastering the Art of French Cooking. <laughs> when dad attempted to carve the turkey, the first time the legs were still pink and raw and the bird was slammed back in the oven, giving us all another jolly hour and a half to deplete the bar. We might have given Jennifer less grief if she hadn't initially tried to defend herself, insisting that the French preferred their birds <laughs> rare, and implying that a thoroughly cooked bird was unsophisticated. When we finally sat down to eat, <clears throat> Brian said grace without letting her off the hook. <clears throat> Notre père qui aime le voyer cru, que ton non soit sacré, sanctifié. Mike interrupted him, asking how he'd like a well-done drumstick up the ass. <laughs> Dad demanded a truce, and for, sev <clears throat> for several minutes, peace prevailed until Dad started to talk about Mom in that maudlin way of his, a recitation that always relied heavily on the concept of her sainthood. Usually, we all collaborated in changing the subject and let leading him out of his quagmire, but now Mike wanted to open the subject for debate. She didn't deserve to suffer, Dad was saying. Well, apparently the person who suffered most was Brian, Mike said. <laughs> At least that's the impression I got from the play. I mean, sure, Mom was dying of cancer and all, but I never realized it hurt Brian so much to administer her shots the one night that he actually managed to sit up with her. <laughs> Maybe I'm a Philistine, but it seemed to me like the point was the one who really suffered wasn't Mom, it was Brian. Okay, okay, Brian said. I'm sorry I said grace in French. That's not really the point, Mike said. Oh, I bet I think it is. I don't blame you for trying to change the subject, you self-centered prick. But you know what? We all grew up in the same house, and we all saw the play. Now, boys, Dad said. You, of all people, know what I'm talking about, Mike said, pointing a fork at our father. Let's be honest. You were freaked out by the play. Dad did not want to go down this road. <clears throat> I had a few concerns, he said. Don't wimp out, Dad. We all talked about this, for Christ's sake. Why are we so worried about Brian's feelings? It's not like he lost any sleep thinking about ours. 
Actually, Cassie said, I happen to know he was very worried about your feelings. I think Foster will agree with me. It's not like he shows it, Mike said. I think it's wonderful how women attribute lofty ideals and fine feelings to us, Foster said. But I'm sorry, if Brian had spent much time worrying about your feelings, it wouldn't have been much of a fucking play. The quip might have diffused the situation, but Mike, like a giant freighter loaded with grievances, was unable to change courses. Brian parried his continuing assault with glib little irrelevancies until Mike eventually stormed out of the room spilling red wine all over the Irish linen tablecloth. But the rest of us considered ourselves fortunate that it wasn't blood. <clears throat> Mike had the fiercest temper in the family, and he was three inches taller and 30 pounds heavier than his elder brother. The whole exchange was pretty representative. While Brian had always charmed and finessed and fibbed his way through life, Mike had a fierce, stubborn honesty and a big chip on his shoulder, which was in some measure a reflection of his belief that Brian had already claimed the upper bunk bed of life before he came <laughs> along and had a chance to choose for himself. If Brian were assailing a castle, he would try to sneak in the back door by seducing the scullery maid. Mike would butt his head against the portcullis until it or he gave way. Mike's youthful transgressions weren't necessarily more numerous or egregious, but unlike Brian, he was inevitably caught and held accountable, in part because he considered it dishonest to hide them. Brian never let the facts compromise his objective, and he seemed almost allergic to them. When he, caught, when he was caught with marijuana, he had an elaborate hack, hackneyed story about how he was holding it for a friend. But when Mike decided to grow it, he did so out in the open, planting rows between the, veg the corn and vegetables in the garden until someone finally told our mother, who'd been giving tours of the garden, <laughs> the true identity of the mystery herb. <laughs> Back then, none of us could have predicted that Mike would eventually be the one to follow our father to business school and General Electric, that he would be diplomatic enough to negotiate the hazards of corporate culture. His reformation owed a lot to Jennifer starting that first year at Colby. It took us a long time to love her. My father was furious over her sophomore art critique, <coughs> uh, art class critique of our parish church, but there was no denying her anodyne effect on Mike. The year before Mike nearly throttled Brian, it was Aiden's turn. He was the baby of the family, which seemed to be his complaint that we treated him as such that we didn't give him enough respect. The specific catalyst this Thanksgiving was obscure. That he was drunk in the manner unique to inexperienced drinkers, he was a senior at Hotchkiss at the time, didn't especially help his case. And sensing this, he became even more frustrated and strident. Just because I'm younger, it doesn't give you guys the right to treat me like I'm a kid. Mom wouldn't have let you. If she was here, she'd tell you. If she were here, Brian said. <laughs> That's exactly what I mean. Treating me like a friggin' baby. We all found it cute that even in his cups, Aiden had used the euphemism rather than the Anglo-Saxonism itself. He wasn't yet ready to cuss in front of Dad. Brian and Mike started sniggering, which further infuriated Aiden, who pounded his fist down on his plate, breaking it in half and cutting his hand on his steak knife, which had been freshly sharpened by Dad this morning. <laughs> We all agreed that Jennifer was the only one sober enough to drive to the emergency room. The touch football games preceding dinner was sometimes an outlet for aggression that might otherwise have overflowed at the table, but it occasionally spilled over as when Brian accused Mike of unnecessary roughness on the field that afternoon. At Christmas, the sport was hockey, assuming that the pond was sufficiently frozen. Our mother, who believed that exercise and fresh air were essential ingredients of the good life, had inaugurated both of these activities. We really should have just canceled Thanksgiving the year the movie came out. Anybody could have predicted disaster. <laughs> Brian spent more than three years working on the screenplay on his own at first and eventually in collaboration with the director. His second play about preppy young bohemians in Tribeca had opened to mixed reviews and closed after an eight-week run. Somewhere in the screenwriting process, the story had acquired a new complication when the dying mother confides in her sensitive son 
about her affair with his father's best friend. In fact, Dad's best friend lived in San Francisco, as Brian was quick to point out later, but still it made us wonder. Mom had been popular with most of the men in our parents' close circle of friends, and one husband, Tom Fleischman, had always seemed comically smitten with her. Now, we started to question if it was really a joke. The way that Fleischman had always mooned around Mom, or whether Brian had really been the recipient of some deathbed confession. Everyone in town had the same question, including Katie Fleischman, who called Dad in a fury after seeing the movie in September, demanding to know what he knew, and it soon became the talk of the country club. The play had been a distant rumor, but the movie was right there <clears throat> next door to the Pathmark store in the Regal <laughs> Cinema Multiplex which had replaced the old downtown theaters where we'd watched Jaws and Summer of 42. And it was more successful than some might have hoped, buoyed by the performance of Maureen Firth as the wife and mother. The movie played at the Regal for seven weeks, and everyone we knew went to see it. Brian had warned us to some extent. On the one hand, he assured us his vision hadn't been compromised, and on the other hand, that accommodations had been made. Nuances flattened, whispers amplified, subtexts excavated with a backhoe and laid bare. In the play, there was a rumor of infatuation. None of us, Foster accepted, had been invited to the premiere in L.A., or rather, we'd all received a phone call from Brian, who had mentioned in passing a big industry rat fuck and said, I'm not even sure I'm going myself. And none of us knew quite what to say after we'd seen it. Brian wrote Dad a letter assuring him that the alleged affair was strictly a Hollywood plot device and had nothing to do with reality. Dad called Foster in New York and was repeatedly reassured. Mike called Brian, threatening to kick his ass. And while the conversation was hardly conclusive, Brian swore that the affair was just a sensationalistic fiction and it seemed as if maybe we'd all had our say by the time Thanksgiving rolled around. We were hoping against hope that the issue would just go away. In an unprecedented move, we even decided to water down the vodka to keep Dad from getting too maudlin. And for the first time since any of us remembered, it looked as if we might pass a relatively peaceful Thanksgiving, having made it all the way to the pumpkin pie without major fireworks. But despite the watered vodka, we could see Dad's eyes glazing over with melancholy reminiscence. I must have let her down somehow, he said, during a lull in the discussion of the Patriots' season. All of us were smart enough to pretend we hadn't heard this remark, but Aiden's fiance was still new to the family. <laughs> let whom down, Mr. C? Carolyn, I must have let her down. She must have needed something I couldn't give her. <laughs> but why would you think that? Jennifer asked. Oh, for Christ's sake, Mike said, throwing his napkin down on the table. Look at what you've done, Brian. Now he actually believes it. Dad, Brian said, I told you it never happened. It's fiction. It's slander, Mike said. I still can't understand why the hell you had to drag our mother's name into the gutter like that. It's not our mother. It's not her name, it's a character in a movie. A character based on our mother. I just must have failed her, Dad said, oblivious <laughs> to the conversation around him. Dad, listen to me, it never happened. I'm sorry, it's my fault. I shouldn't have written what I wrote. It was the director's idea, a cheap plot device. It isn't true. I always thought it was harmless, Dad said. They used to talk at parties and I knew they had things in common. Your mother had so many interests, art, and theater, and I really couldn't talk to her about those things. I, I knew she and Tom talked, but, but I thought that's all it was. That is all it was, Brian said, at least so far as I know. I know she told you things, he said to Brian, things she couldn't tell me. Not that, Dad. She never told me anything like that. After my operation, he said, I was afraid. I was afraid of physical, you know, exertion. <laughs> Dad, that's enough. <laughs> Are you happy with yourself, Mike asked. 
Well, who's for a smoke outside, Foster said, rising from the table. Although Dad was a lifelong smoker, our mother had, toward the end of her life, insisted that all smoking be done outdoors, a rule that Dad himself had continued to observe and enforce after she was gone. A half hour after we put Dad to bed, Mike tackled Brian and got him in a headlock, choking him and rubbing his face in the snow. Tell the truth, goddammit, what did she tell you? I told you, it's not true. She never told me anything. But nothing could ever quite dispel the doubt for us. Dad might have been forgiven for lying low, but he was determined to show himself on the local holiday, holiday party circuit. A week before Christmas, after three cocktail parties, he crashed his Mustang into an elm tree half a mile from the house. Mike, who was working in Schenectady, was the first to arrive at the hospital. Dad was in intensive care. Aiden drove over from Amherst, arriving shortly before midnight. Brian and Foster arrived from New York just as the sun was rising and Dad was declared stable. We all spent the day at the hospital and that night traded shifts in the waiting room. Dad looked gruesome when we finally got to see him, his face bruised and puffy and green where it wasn't bandaged, his leg in traction. He was pretty doped up. Don't tell your mother, he said when he saw us. I don't want her to worry. The doctor who tended our mother in her final days said, it's the Demerol. I think we could all use some of that, Foster said. We moved between the hospital and the house for the next 10 days, keeping ourselves busy with Christmas preparations. We found a perfectly shaped blue spruce tree in the woods at the edge of the lake, and we retrieved the ornaments from the attic in the old boxes from England's department store closed years before, with mom's block letters fading on the cardboard, Christmas lights, Christmas angels, Christmas bulbs. We avoided talking about what had happened or why, concentrating instead on the practical details. The lake had frozen early that year. After lunch on Christmas Eve, we gathered up our gear, called Ricky and Ted Quinlan next door and trudged down for the annual hockey game. It was Foster, Ted, and Aiden against Brian, Ricky, and Mike. Brian's team scored two quick goals. Aiden, who had the fiercest competitive streak of any of us, started to get physical. First he hooked Brian's skate and tripped him, then he body checked him into the rocks of the causeway. Mm -hmm. Brian returned the favor the next time he came down the ice with the puck, knocking Aiden off into the bulrushes. He came out swinging and caught Brian in the helmet with his stick. Then he threw him down and knelt on top of him, ripping off his helmet and punching his face. By the time we pulled him off, there was blood everywhere, and one of Brian's teeth was protruding through his lip. You bastard, Aiden sobbed. You selfish bastard. Brian turned away and limped up the hill, leaving a trail of blood on the ice. When we got back to the house, Brian was gone. Dad came home on New Year's Day. Aiden took winter term off from school to be with him, and Mike came over from Schenectady on the weekends. Brian called from New York to check in. Neither the fight on the ice nor his sudden departure was ever discussed again. From time to time, in his cups, Brian would ask, <coughs> Dad would ask Brian about our mother, and he would always insist that the affair and the confession were completely fictional. Dad once confronted Tom Fleischman at the country club, and he, too, denied it. But Dad could never put the question out of his mind any more than he could walk without a cane. Mike and Jennifer had three boys, and he became the youngest vice president ever at GE. Aiden spent a year with the U.S. ski team before marrying Alana and going back to Hotchkiss to teach. Foster, one of the most respected directors in New York, recently married Cassie Haynes, the actress who first appeared at our house as Brian's date. We go down to see his plays from time to time. Brian moved to Los Angeles a few weeks after Aiden busted his lip. He wrote a TV pilot, and while that project died, it led to a job as a staff writer for a long-running comedy show. We can't help feeling relieved that he's not writing about the family. 
and Dad watches the show every week. Brian is very well paid for his efforts and has been dating a series of extremely pretty actresses. But it also feels somehow like a cheat, a big fucking letdown. After all these years of having to put up with the idea of Brian as a great genius and knowing that our mother believed in his special destiny, we feel like the least he could do would be to justify her favor and her hopes instead of spending his days writing mother-in-law jokes. <laughs> Nothing short of greatness could justify the doubt that he cast on her memory. Foster believes that he's doing penance and that he'll go back to his real work someday. In the meantime, we haven't all been together at Thanksgiving since Dad's accident. Now, when the leaves turn red and yellow and the grass turns white with morning frost, we feel a loss all over again. It's like we were a goddess cult that gathered once a year, and now our faith has wavered. It's not that we couldn't forgive her anything, but our simple certainties have been shaken. Although we will always be Catholics, we long ago gave up on the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We were a coven of Mariolatry, devoted to the Virgin. Brian believed in art, but lately he seems to have lost the faith. We find it hard to believe in anything we can't see or explain according to the immutable laws imbued in science class. We always believed in you, Mother, more than anything, but we never for a moment thought you were human. as long as we said it should be. Um, <laughs> now, do I do questions now? <laughs> no, so I've never, written, I've never read that story before. It's... Right. So, I mean, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I wrote it, but I never read it. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when in the process did you make the choice to have a, um, to have a son? Like, what was the thought process behind that? Like, what was the yeah, um, You know, I, I, I started off... I, I thought it would just be something in the first, you know, I'd do the first paragraph and then switch to a more conventional um, narrative. Um, the same thing happened with my first novel, Bright Lights, Big City. I was starting in the second person. I, I just thought, well, we probably can't keep putting this up for too long. And I ended up doing it for an entire book. But um, I, I thought it would be fun. I mean, it, it creates, it cre you know, created certain uh, oddnesses, but I, but I, I thought they somehow were, were justified. I mean, at, at, you know, at, at, no, at no point do you, you know, do you have a single point of view. And um, I, um, you know, I, I, I had to figure out certain, certain strategies to get around the peculiarity of the, of the first person plural voice. But I, 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 on balance, I thought it, it sort of worked. Yeah. Um, it was, but it was fun. It was fun to attempt and fun to execute, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering if you've ever felt as a writer that the cost of writing about things familiar to you has been too great. Well, this story is kind of about that. Yeah. Um, I have certainly, uh, I have certainly had some uh, uh, bumps with my with my family and my friends. Um, it's funny though, sometimes you write about people and they, and they, they, don't, they don't realize at all that they're, I mean, it's, it, it's usually the most egregious characters who, who, who just don't realize how horrible they actually are in real life. And, and, and I've, also had, I've also had people, um, I, I've had a number of people in my life who claim to be models for, for, the, for the more attractive characters when, <laughs> when in fact they weren't at all. Um, yeah, I, I think that um, yeah, the, ba the basis of this story really is that I, I, I did have a dispute with one of, one of my brothers. Um, I, I actually wrote a nonfiction memoir about our family, which was published in The New Yorker uh, in 1995, I think. And, um, and he was very upset with uh, the piece. I mean, I just, just more with the idea that I would, 
write about the family, I think, than really with any specific, um, I mean, he, he didn't really dispute the facts. He was, he was just very upset with me, and he didn't speak to me for a year. And so that was, that was partly the impetus, I think, for, for this story. But, um, but I think that, you know, you, I don't think you can be a very good writer without being willing to, um, to um, hurt your family's feelings <laughs> occasionally. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I, I, I'm, a little, I'm a little nervous. My, my daughter's here tonight, and she's a very good writer, and I, I, I fear that I'm going to have many moments like that myself. But, um, it, it, I don't know, you know, I mean, Faulkner had the extreme point of view. He said basically that, you know, you know, King Lear was worth you know, the lives of any number of old ladies, and uh, <laughs> I, I, I think you have to be—I think you have to be a little bit uh, callous and fearless when you set out to use the material of your of your life and even your loved ones. I nobody—I don't seem to have infuriated anybody with this story. Right? I'm glad to say, <laughs> except that my brother's uh, my brother's um, wife insists that she never undercooked the turkey. <laughs> and, and of course, I said, what makes you think that character was you? <laughs> yeah. It seems like I've I talked to a lot of people who, who want to write, but they're not actually writing themselves. Um, and there's a great, a great quote from your uh, first novel here, Bright Lights, Big City, that I'd like to share. It speaks to this idea. It starts out, uh, you were gathering experience for a novel. You went to parties with writers, cultivated a writerly persona. You wanted to be Dylan Thomas without the paunch, F. Scott Fitzgerald without the crack up. You wanted to skip over the dull grind of actual creation. After a hard day of work on other people's manuscripts, knowing in your heart that you could do better, the last thing you wanted to do was go home and write. You wanted to go out. I thought, yeah, I thought you were going to read that fast. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah, that was the that was the story of my early writing years. Uh, well, it's not not writing. <laughs> I, I actually had a real turning point when um, I, I, was, I was living that sort of pretend writer's life and imagining myself as a writer. And I, I finally um, I met Raymond Carver, the great short story writer, one, one, one day when, actually one morning, uh, when my, my best friend uh, from college, uh, who was working as an editorial assistant at Random House, sent him to my apartment, uh, knowing what a fan I was. And he had nothing to do between lunch and this reading he was giving at Columbia, and he just showed up on my <laughs> doorstep, really. And, and it was pretty, uh, it was pretty interesting, because I'd actually been up, you know, up all night, and I was kind of disheveled, and uh, and, and we, we actually really hit it off and had a great talk, but it, after talking to me for a few hours, Carver, Carver's basically said, you know, this life you're living here is not remotely conducive to writing, and he said, maybe, maybe you ought to think about coming, leaving New York, and I actually stayed in touch with him, went and, and quit my. No, actually, I didn't quit my job in New York. I got fired. But um, I, um, I, I did realize at some point that I had to make the commitment full time. And one of the things Carver said to me was, "You, you know, you have to write every day, and you have to, you know, you have to really sit down, whether you're in a good mood, a bad mood." Uh, uh, whether it's raining or sunny, uh, and you've got to put the words on, um, you know, as Maupassant said, put black on white every day. And, uh, and it, it was, um, but, but there was, you know, there was a, there was a long period there where I was pretending. <laughs> when, you, yeah. uh, when you finally uh, committed yourself to writing full time, um, what were you doing in the interim? Uh, when I when I did, I became I, I went to Syracuse University where, where Carver was teaching along with Tobias Wolf, another really excellent short story writer. And I um, uh, I was I was fortunate enough to get a, a fellowship. So um, it was about four thousand dollars, but it was almost enough. And uh, and I um, I just uh, I was in the graduate program. I studied English and creative writing, and really did write every day. You know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of controversy. Well, particularly in Europe, people think the idea of creative writing, being able, of, of teaching creative writing, is 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 fraudulent. But I I think you know, being in a community of like-minded people and, and maybe having uh, the mentorship of of uh, somebody farther down the road uh, in the right in, in the writing uh, career, a career uh, was very helpful for me. 
and I think it is for a lot of people. And um, your pattern to your writing day, are you writing week even? Um, the pattern uh, that I have is um, that I try to I try to start writing before nine in the morning, um, and I try to write at least until lunch, and then. Um, some people are nighttime writers, but I, I find the uh, morning more conducive. And then, if things are going well, then I continue after, after lunch. And at the beginning, the very beginning and the very end of a book, uh, I tend to write really long hours, you know, often late into the night, because um, uh, particularly at the end, I, I, I feel like I'm, you know, I've gained momentum, and I'm, if, if I'm lucky, I'm feeling kind of on fire. If you're not feeling on fire, then something might be wrong. I, I actually just finished a draft of a book last year, and I, and I didn't have that feeling as I was finishing it. And as a result, I've just put the book on the shelf, and uh, I'm not sure that I will publish it. Do you take um, long breaks then between books? Uh, let's see. The long, the long breaks between books. Um, I don't like to take too long a break because I'm always afraid I'll never, then I'll forget how to do it. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, I, I, I wish, I wish I felt like that writing fiction was, was, was like practicing the law or something, but I, but I, but I feel like every book I have to learn an awful lot of things all over again. Um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe the previous book was in, written in the first person and then I have to, rem, you know, I have to figure out how to write the next book in the third person and, um, I mean, obviously, some obviously, there's a lot of um, ways in which you gain confidence and learn uh, uh, learn technique and and, uh, and find your own voice. But it's still um, it's still kind of scary. With I'm finishing a book, I'm I worry about whether there there will be a next one. So I so I try not to make it too long. But I, but I do other I, I do journalism and book reviews and. Uh, uh, I write about wine sometimes, which is a, uh, so I so I try to intersperse fiction with other projects too. Um, other questions? Yes. I'm just curious. Do you work off a word processor? But now I'm aging myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> a computer, or or do you really like putting a pen uh, or a paper? Uh, Pencil to paper. Well, my first novel was written on a typewriter, and um, God, over and over and over, you know. Um, <laughs> it's funny to think about, you know, ripping, ripping a half-finished sheet out of a paper, which up out of the the carriage, because you made too many mistakes and throwing it away and starting again. And I, I love the, I love the word the word processor be, for that reason, and also because it gives you a certain fluidity of the sense, you know, you don't. You don't say, "Oh, damn! I've already written, you know, I've already written the sentence that way. Do I want to like white white it out and rewrite it or not?" And, and obviously, we don't have that problem with word processing. Um, but what I do like to do is I like to print often, and, and, and then I take the text and I mark it up. And I, and I I would be very very um, unhappy about not being able to work off paper. There's something a little more real to me about seeing the paper and. and and editing on paper, and in fact, my my editor, the who, uh, the same person who's edited all my books, um, who was my was um, who I met at Williams uh, when I was there as an undergraduate, he uh, he insists on doing all his editing on paper, um, which 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 I like. Oh, I don't always like it. I don't like it when he writes like "duh" in the margin. <laughs> that's a, that's a little annoying. <laughs> um, but he's, he's, uh, he's bad that way. But, but uh, yeah, I, I I love I love the fact that I just don't have to retype my manuscripts over and over again. But but once I edit them, I, I, whenever I finish a chapter, I print it and I I mess it up and then I go back and, and enter the changes that way. Yes. Really dumb question, but do you know your endings? No, that's, that's not a dumb question. That's not a dumb question. I, I almost never know the endings of my really? books. So. Oh. And I, 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 
I know writers who, who do, and I sort of envy them, but at the same time, I, I, I sort of feel like the ending should be a, an organic part of the process, and it should come out of the process. And I, I, I almost feel like if, if you already know the ending, then um, what's the point? Uh, John Irving writes his last chapters first. Scott Fitzgerald um, map, outlined his stories very meticulously, um, before, or his novels, before he wrote them, and apparently he knew the ending. My friend Brady Sinellis, you know, same has the same process. Um, uh, but I never know where I'm going. I, I like what um, Ed Doctorow said. Uh, his pictures out there, and uh, he's Sag Harbor resident. I'm sure many of you know his work. And uh, when I was a very young writer, I interviewed him for uh, God, I think it was Vogue or something. This was before I'd ever published anything. And uh, I asked him that same question. He said, "For me, he said, for him, that writing a novel was like driving across country at, at night." And he said, you, you, "You can't. You can only see as far as the headlights, but 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 you can make the whole trip that way." And uh, I mean, if you if you if you unpack that metaphor too far, it falls apart a little bit. Because <laughs> presumably you have a map, but uh, but 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 I like the idea that you know. I mean, he you know he can he can see. You know, and I, and I agree with this. I can sort of see a chapter ahead of me, but I, I can't see two chapters ahead of me. And then, and then, but somehow I get there in the end. You know, Thank you. well, one hopes. Um, a couple more, yeah. Um, for the good life, um, you said you write journalism as well. Did you research a lot for 9/11, or did you go down there? Um, were you living um, there? Well, the, the question's about my last uh, novel, or my last published novel, The Good Life. And uh, um, I mean, I do research uh, when I need to. Uh, for instance, you know, when I have a character who's a banker, uh, that's something that I tend to, to uh, research. Or, uh, um, but in the case of September 11th, I, w I was there. Um, I actually saw, the, I saw both planes hit out, out my window. Um, I was just getting up and I had my, my blind was stuck and I was fooling with the blind and I was just staring at this big window and, and, and the World Trade Center was right in front of me. And, uh, and after that I went down there to, um, uh, like many people I was trying to uh, volunteer and I was, I was fortunate enough to figure out that there was one subway line that I could get through on and I, and I managed to get past the police barricades underground and I I subsequently worked for five or six weeks as a volunteer at, um, at Ground Zero. Um, so a lot of the uh, a lot of the material in The Good Life came from that experience. I mean, at, I, at the time, I didn't think it would be material because um, I, was, I was like everybody, I was so horrified by what had happened that I, I thought maybe literature was dead and fiction was irrelevant. And I wasn't sure I would ever write a novel again. Um, but a few months later, it seemed to me that, um, that that I should. I mean, since New York was my subject and my chosen turf as a writer, I, I, th I thought it would be kind of uh, almost cowardly not to try to, in some way, record that experience. And, and uh, the, the, the only thing I didn't do was write about September 11th itself. Uh, those of you who read it, the, the book starts on September 10th, and, and then the, uh, there are three chapters set on September 10th, and then the, the, the chap chapter four is, uh, starts on September, the morning of September 12th. And I think we all sort of had that day in common in a way, and we all, and at the same time that we all had our own very private experiences of it. Like yeah, very definitely. <laughs> Yeah, it's like looking at the sun, you know, I mean, it's better to look around the edges, I think. Um, and what I really wanted to write about was the aftermath, you know, like, the emotional reaction. I, I didn't want to write about terrorism or global politics or, um, or the, um, um, you know, the, 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 the physics of, of, of the building collapsing. I wanted to, uh, but I wanted to write about the way that it affected us. You know, my, my, my people, my character, you know, the kind of people I write about, the kind of people that I actually live among, actually. And it was a very, very weird time, as I'm sure many of you remember it. Norman Mailer said, don't write about it for 10 years. He said, it'll take that long to figure out what it means. But, but I'm glad that I 
didn't take that advice because because to me, it's almost hard to believe the way that we felt back then. It's and it's hard to remember how how it seemed that nothing would ever be the same. How how shell shocked we were. How raw, you know. Um, and it was um, I think it was a fascinating time, and I'm glad that I wrote about it closer to the time rather than later. Because you know even. Just having the anniversary recently, I, 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 it sort of seemed unreal in a way. I thought, wow, has it really been 10 years and did we really, did we really feel all those things? And, you know, and, and, and we didn't all change our lives forever and become like saintly people as, as we promised ourselves that we would. But on the other hand, when I felt the earthquake uh, from the 13th floor of my building the other day, I, I was right back there. <laughs> I thought, oh, damn, you're in here. It's happening. <laughs> Something's happening again. So it's not far under the surface either, I think. Um, but I don't want to keep you all, but um, maybe oh, one, one more or two more questions. I, 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 yeah, yeah, apparently there's some yeah, books to yeah. sign. So, so um, yes, over, over here. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I, I believe I will thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.